Hey, Jim, how's it going today? Good, how are you doing? Doing good, doing good. So, of course, you're doing play-by-play commentary for Access TV, New Japan Pro Wrestling. My first question for you, what was the deciding factor in you wanting to do play-by-play commentary for New Japan Pro Wrestling? What was it about it that made you want to go there and to say that I want to conquer this, I want to explore this venture? Well, I like the product very much. Uh, I have uh, discovered that uh, Access TV is a great network to work for. Mark Cuban and staff has, have been extremely professional. Uh, and I like the schedule, going out to L.A., you know, eight, nine times a year and, and uh, voicing over over a two-day period, a cluster of shows. Uh, it really fits my uh, travel, uh, not to say demands, but, you know, what I travel preferences, I guess. So uh, a lot of good things, you know, I, but the main thing is if I didn't like the wrestling, if I didn't like the product, I, I wouldn't do it just for the payday. Even mm-hmm. though the schedule is nice and the people I'm working with are good, uh, I, you know, I got to be able to mostly invest in what I'm calling, and I can do that with this product. And for me personally, I never really watched much of New Japan Pro Wrestling up until last year until I heard that you were calling the Wrestle Kingdom 9 show last January and January of 2015, on your birthday, that is, uh, last year. And it was a great show. Obviously, you added to the atmosphere of the event itself. It was an awesome time, and I've been checking out the product more currently. Um, So what was that experience like for you calling Wrestle Kingdom 9 last January? And what were the similarities and differences? Because, of course, WrestleMania, or Wrestle Kingdom, rather, for those unfamiliar, is kind of like their version of WrestleMania. So what were the similarities? Similarities and differences between WrestleMania and Wrestle Kingdom for you? Well, it was an adventure uh, going to Tokyo uh, because obviously the travel, uh, the language barrier. You know, I don't speak great English, so first of all, so uh, me uh, explaining myself to someone that uh, speaks only Japanese it can be somewhat entertaining. But I, I can give this story real quick. Uh, we came on the air for that, that show, the pay per view of Wrestle Kingdom 9. We were not counted on the air. So I started talking because I saw the Japanese broadcasters talking. So I figured we were on the air. And, uh, but I thought this will change because we'll get, we'll get some counts to, uh, you know, interviews or pyro or whatever, off the air even. Nothing. We, we were there over three hours and never heard from the truck once. So we, I came on the air guessing when, when to come on. I said goodnight when I thought it was appropriate. And uh, we just, we call the show completely unencumbered and but with nothing, no communication. So that's how that show went. So you can imagine it's not that way with WWE. Uh, they're a lot more uh, hands-on and the production is much more meticulous and uh, thorough. So uh, you got more, and, and, and of course, the, you know, it's hard to equate it, quite frankly, because with the WWE crew, you know, the same guy's been around for a long time. You work your audio guy, your stage manager, all that stuff, you know, they're good people. So uh, this, it, was, it was an adventure. I, 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 I had a blast. You know, I was, we, could, we were either going to be good, Stryker and I, or we weren't, and it's going to be our deal, period, because we weren't getting any help or hindrance in our headset. So what was it like working with Matt Stryker? I know you guys had some experience in working together for a brief period of time back in 2009, 2010 on the SmackDown brand. So what was it kind of like uh, reuniting with him for the Wrestle Kingdom 9 show? Well, he's entertaining. You know, he's a he's a unique cat, and he's got uh, you know unique views of, of things. And and uh, I like the fact that he thinks outside the box, and he's willing to express himself uh, when at times others may not uh, uh, do so. So he's he's always good to work with. He's got product knowledge, uh, and uh, so he's a he's he's quirky. He reminds me of George Costanza a little bit. He's the George Costanza of broadcasters. He's got high IQ, always asking questions, has a unique vent on things. So, uh, but he's fun to work with. You know, I had, it was, that was the easy part. You know, working with Matt's not, not challenging at all. So it made, it made the broadcast better, I think. Now, that's a great comparison. I absolutely agree. I felt like you guys made for a great team for that show. And also, speaking of New Japan Pro Wrestling, along with AJ Styles and Suzuki, or uh, Shinsuke and Nakamura, rather, are there any other potential stars in that promotion right now that you would feel that would thrive in WWE at the moment? Well, they got a lot of good young guys. You know, it's a, some of it would be a commitment to see if WWE would commit to uh, really utilizing uh, all the way to the main event level smaller guys. And then if that, would, if that were true, 
then there are a lot of guys there that have a good shot because they're, they have great skill sets. Uh, Ibushi's very good. Uh, you know, I like Kenta a lot. They're really talented. They, they have a lot of guys. They're just, you know, with, with uh, Shinsuke Nakamura leaving and Gallows and, Ander- and uh, Anderson and, of course, uh, AJ, uh, it really opens the door for uh, some elevation for some guys. So I think what I'm looking at is a very competitive marketplace for them in their locker room to see who's going to get their market share of those uh, uh, guys that have left. And it's, uh, that's always a good situation. It's good for the locker room. It's good for the fans. It, sh- it reshuffles your deck and doesn't allow your roster to get stale. So uh, people leaving and coming and going is not a bad thing. And you had AJ on your podcast a couple of years ago talking about his time in TNA, potentially going to WWE. Of course, this was recorded before he went to WWE and after he left the TNA. Um, but what have your thoughts been so far? I know you've touched upon this before on your podcast and in your blogs and whatnot. What have, what have been your thoughts so far on AJ Styles and how they've utilized him so far in WWE? I have no issues with it at all. I like the uh, fact that he got a spotlight at the Royal Rumble. Uh, I thought that was was good. Uh, and I thought his, his uh, uh, efforts in the Rumble were well-received and stood out. I remembered what he did. I remembered him entering and all that stuff, his presentation. So that to me was a hit. Uh, but he's luckily, he's been married to Jericho. And Jericho, is uh, Chris, is a really... Obviously, a skilled uh, hand that knows what is required to uh, to get the job done, where that job may be. So, I like the fact that they split them up after the little uh, tag team uh, flirtation, because I think WWE has seemingly committed that they want to get AJ a signature win in his first WrestleMania, and beating the first ever undisputed champion is a, I would think, a nice way of doing that. Should be a great story to be. The announcer should have a great story to tell. Uh, in that match, so uh, and those guys have a chance to really impact the show in a positive way, mm-hmm. i.e., maybe steal the show uh, because I don't know what to expect of that match. It's, a, it's an undercard match. It's a preliminary match. It's not a main event, but I think both guys are going to wrestle it as a main event, which is always uh, the right thing to do. Give your best effort uh, and, and try to steal the show. Not a bad thing. Absolutely, and like you said, I feel like the story is there. They've been building towards this. As you mentioned, since Styles came into the Rumble match, they've got two months under their belt. They've had some great matches at Fastlane on Raw, SmackDown. And speaking of which, like you said, the commentator should have just a ball calling the match at WrestleMania. I mean, it's yet to be confirmed, but it's looking like that's the that's the direction they're going in. And one of those matches, like I said, came on SmackDown a few weeks ago, being called by none other than Mauro Ronaldo, who uh, previously did the play-by-play commentary before you for uh, Access TV for New Japan Pro Wrestling. What have your thoughts been so far his addition to the SmackDown brand and his th- and your thoughts on him just as a commentator in general. Well, Mauro and I've been friends for a long time, and I've admired his work since. Uh, really, I started calling him in Pride way back in the day, and then you know, then in more recent times on Strike Force and uh, selected Showtime boxing events. Uh, my new boxing partner Al Bernstein and he are partners on Showtime. I enjoyed their work a great deal. So, uh, so Marlon's doing, doing really good. I mean, he's, he's adding uh, a new voice and a new delivery, a new philosophy somewhat uh, to uh, the broadcast table at WWE. And I think that uh, with the antagonist Jerry Lawler uh, continuing to evolve back into that role, I think that uh, they're going to mesh very well. So uh, Marlon was a great hire uh, by WWE, I think, a great hire. And, you know, obviously... It created an opportunity for me, and I, of which I am embracing. When my agent called, said to Access TV called, and wants you to know if you're interested in doing the New Japan Wrestling. And you know, my first question was, well, what about Morrow? Because mm-hmm. I had no desire to interview for a job if it was going to uh, cost Morrow a situation, a, a, a position whatsoever. It just wasn't that would never happen for me. So uh, I'm happy that uh, he got an opportunity and with WWE because that was his goal, certainly one of his goals, and they're allowing him to continue to do MMA. He does, you know, he's done uh, this week in uh, MMA on Access on Friday nights. He's in the host of that uh, mm-hmm. with Bad Boss Rutten. So uh, I'm glad to see him doing all the things he likes to do. He's a good guy. He has some va- battles that he, he, he wages daily. Uh, that I'm, uh, He's an honorable guy, and he's uh, 
you know, he deserves success. So I'm happy for him. I just feel badly that some people in, in Twitter can't seemingly mention him without mentioning me in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, and uh, because he's, he and I are different, we're different cats. You know, we're we're not just we're, we do the same job, but we do it differently. And there are some similarities, but uh, basically he's his guy and I'm mine. And I wish him nothing but the best. And but I will tell you that uh, Josh Barnett and I have a, have our plan that we're going to be the best pro wrestling broadcast team in the business. That's our goal. So, uh, and it's not a matter of if we're going to do it, it's a matter of when we're going to do it because we both have that strong mindset and, and we're competitive. So it's a, it's a fun time. It's a good time. I'm glad to get some skin back in the game. It's good to, good to get a jersey and start playing again. <laughs> And I think moreover than anything else as well, I think his addition to SmackDown kind of gives that brand uh, a fresh feel for the first time in a long time. And I know you've talked about this as well, you know, in past years, what they can do to kind of differi- differentiate SmackDown from Raw, because they kind of feel like the same product. And adding a commentator who isn't available on Raw, Mario Ronaldo, and kind of changing up the look of the show and promoting stuff in advance, stuff they haven't done in many years since, you know, your time in calling SmackDown back in 08, 2009. Um, I mean, this has been a huge topic for a while now, but do you feel, in your personal opinion, that kind of changing up the landscape of Raw from SmackDown is kind of a, uh, a sign of things to come with a potential return of the brand split? Do you feel it's necessary or even viable right now to have a brand split in the WWE? I don't have any issues with brand split if it's uh, pure and there's no intermingling. Uh, there's no intergender stuff. Uh, to any degree at all. If you are going to have a brand split, then, then make it that. Uh, and then strategically plan for a cross-pollination. It's just not done because you don't have a better idea for TV this week. I'd also have the writers, uh, exclusive Raw and exclusive SmackDown writers. And and I'd, I'd like for them to compete against each other a little bit more. And, and the same with the roster. Build your own roster do your storylines and, uh, uh, you know, from show to show. But the only thing about that is then you get on Raw, you do some highlight package of SmackDown so people can see what's going on. And likewise, on SmackDown, a little highlight package from Raw. But it'd be, it'd be clear that it was a Raw, Raw inclusion or SmackDown inclusion in those shows. So uh, you keep it se- separate as much as you can, I think, is the best way of doing that. Uh, but... It's a matter of having, can you get 16 or 18 guys and gals uh, on each roster, maybe 20, can you, you have 40 players. And that, what it does, it, it certainly in theory, opens up slots for guys to come, and women to come in and uh, to fill those slots and get, to, get some playing time. So I don't have any issue with the brand split as long as there's certain rules of engagement that are followed. But if it's just the same old, uh, we're going to have a brand split and then we're going to, in, a, in, a, in two or three weeks, we're already mixing metaphors, so to speak. Uh, I'm not for that. So uh, I don't know what they're going to do after WrestleMania, but I, I, I know that you would think that you will see the uh, the flow of new talent being introduced, hopefully in a systematic, impactful way, well thought out plan after WrestleMania. No sense in introducing anybody new before WrestleMania, in my estimation. No, yeah, I agree. I feel like, especially right after WrestleMania, that's traditionally the time they call people up from NXT. I mean, last year we saw Neville, the Lucha Dragons, all the women during the summer. So, I mean, I feel like that's the time. Maybe we see Balor or Enzo and Cass or a few other fresh faces from NXT. But, yeah, I agree. I mean, especially towards the end, too. The brand split was muddled, and, you know, like you said, they were kind of doing the cross-promotion stuff way too much towards the end, so it didn't really work. But if they need to do it, it needs to be absolutely pure. Um, But also, speaking of the current roster, is there anyone, not only in WWE, but just in wrestling today, just in general, do you feel that could be a future commentator once they retire from the ring as someone like... You know, there, there's been many people over the years. Even Matt Stryker, a former competitor, is now doing the commentary for Lucha Underground. So do you feel like anyone in the wrestling scene today would make a great commentator once they're done with their in-ring wrestling days? Well, there should be. Yeah, the, the, the gift that they have to have is uh, they have to be able to put uh, other talents over, not just themselves. Uh, I've done commentary, uh, guest commentary shots and shows and pay-per-views and various sundry things with wrestlers. They're very good at talking about themselves, by and large. But the good ones, the really ones that get great at it, are the ones that can put other talents over. And, uh, you know, uh, that's why Heenan and Lawler uh, were great. Terry Funk was very underrated in that role. In today's world, 
you know, there's probably a lot of guys, you know, it, it depends on how much of a student of broadcasting they want to become and are they willing to put the time in preparation and study that they did in learning to work and get their bodies in shape and all that, all that stuff aesthetically. And uh, are you willing to invest the same amount of time and effort into in becoming a broadcaster? Because you can't be a, a wrestler on the mic. You've got to transition to becoming a broadcaster. And, uh, and that is a matter of individual commitment. But as far as being glib, uh, intelligent, uh, and being able to, to uh, process the information and repeat it, I would think there's a lot of guys there. You know, uh, Big Show's actually got a very good gift of gab, uh, for example. Probably be, you know, he'd, be the, he's, he'd sort of be the world's largest broadcaster, so uh, for what that's worth. But, but there should be a lot of guys there, but it's just not automatic because they were good in the ring. They're going to be good telling stories and putting talents over and positioning the talents in a, in a proper way. It's a challenging job, especially in WWE where they have so many uh, masters to serve, like, you know, social media and shopping and uh, other company news. You know, they use that three-hour show on Monday night for a, a multitude of things, and a lot of it's platform to disseminate information and, uh, and, and sales material as well. So it's, a, it's not easy, but there should be plenty of guys there. I mean, I don't know. I can sit down with them in a day. If guys have wanted to audition and audition them and give you a list, I need to kind of see how they how they how they do and how they sound on the headset and all that good stuff. And of course, in WWE and most broadcasting, the look is important. So that's why you know Byron Saxton has such a, has such a, a presence. He's on both shows Monday mm-hmm. and, and Thursday, so he's getting a tremendous amount of exposure, uh, an amazing opportunity to really break through because he's got a great look and he's uh, intelligent and well spoken. He needs to be uh, make, becoming a star right now because he's got that golden opportunity on two primetime TV shows a week uh, to get quote unquote over, and, and but he will, he'll get over by getting talent over. It works that way. It doesn't come him first and then them. It's them and then he tags along and organically gets over as well. Yeah, I think he would be a perfect example because he was another guy that was also a wrestler. I mean, not many people knew that because he only competed, I think, on NXT for a time before kind of becoming a commentator full-time. I think Corey Graves is another guy, too, who also has kind of come into his own as a commentator after retiring from the ring a couple of years ago. And I know you've talked about The Miz before and his role is kind of out as a manager in the future, but he also kind of tried his hand as a commentator a couple of years ago, and he did pretty well at it. So those are some guys. All that those guys you mentioned are, oh, again, I'm sure could uh, morph into that role very well. Mm-hmm. But here's the point I was making uh, that Corey Grace is getting time on NXT and he's uh, he is doing a, a really good job. He's, you can tell he's working at it. He's getting better. Uh, and he's, he's improving every week seemingly. But he doesn't get the exposure that Byron Saxon gets on Monday Night Raw and, and SmackDown. Mm-hmm. So Byron's the guy that's sitting in the greatest spot of all because he's got the most exposure. He's the youngest. Uh, he's unique, being a man of color. Uh, great uh, great personality. Uh, really intelligent kid. So he's the guy that, that, that they're shining the light on. Whether he's fully aware of that or anybody else around him is fully aware of that or not, it's pretty obvious to me. And, and, I, I, and I applaud the move. I just think, hey, look, here's the chance you got, Byron. I can grab this son of a gun and... Uh, you know, this is this is when I get this when I get mine, and I want to I want to establish my body of work, and my body of work is what's going to carry me uh, forward in this in this process. And also as well, I mean, you mentioned NXT, and I was watching the most recent DVD they just came out with, the greatest matches in NXT history, and of course you called the number of matches early on in the promotion's history back in 2012 when you were doing commentary alongside uh, William Regal, which on paper is a dream team, and it absolutely was. You guys worked great together, and of course now Regal is doing the uh, the GM role, the general manager role for NXT. So um, during at that time, what was your experience you know, doing commentary for NXT and, and doing it? Early on in 2012, and now four years later, did you think doing commentary back when they first revamped the product was that it would become what it has become today? Well, did, uh, you said you watched the uh, best uh, of DVD mm-hmm. of NXT matches. Did any of my matches make the air? 
Yeah, I think a couple of the matches that you called, I think the Seth Rollins and Jinder Mahal one, and there was another one from 2012 that I know you called. It might have been after that, because I know that NXT, that was the crown the first ever NXT champion. And there was another match you called, too. Uh, but I know that definitely Seth Rollins and Jinder Mahal was on there. Out, it's great, though. I haven't heard that work back. I, I've never heard my work from NXT. Wow, really? Uh, back in the uh, So I'll, I think I, I'll get the DVD and, and check it out. So thanks for that info. I enjoyed uh, doing the work down there because it was pure. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was a, a status or a situation where uh, it was all about the product. Uh, the politics were uh, kind of melded away and uh, there was a lot of pretense a lot of supposition it was very straightforward positive uh kids are bright-eyed and bushy-tailed as they say they wanted to learn their minds are open uh, they saw opportunity awaiting them so they, it was a really refreshing positive environment to be around and i i will tell you that in my last several years at wwe the, the my favorite thing to do was to go to Florida and work with the uh, NXT kids because that's the future of the business. The WWE has no investment in their company more important than uh, their performance center because the, T the WWE runs on two things, talent and television. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and without uh, a new uh, a stream of new stars being developed, they're in big, big trouble. People get tired simply uh, very easily now and their attention spans are shorter, and they get tired of people, and the wrong turn in the road creatively can, can burn somebody, just like uh, Roman Reigns is miscast as a fan favorite when he's not one right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and he'd be a phenomenal villain, uh, and I think that's what the fans are trying to say. So, uh, but I had a great time down there, and it was good to be around that environment. I think wrestling and life in general needs more mentors and coaches, life coaches, that's what the, all the, the veterans down in, in, in NXT have the opportunity uh, to contribute. They can have an opportunity to contribute to the foundation uh, and the fundamentals of the, these, the careers of these men and women that are going to lead the company in the future. Uh, so so I, I had a great time. I saw what was there. It was an extension of what we did in OVW and, and, and Louisville, of course, in Cincinnati with uh, Les Thatcher and, mm -hmm. and down in Memphis. Uh, Rick Bassman out in California, you know, all of our little developmental areas and, and cooperative ventures that we had. So uh, you know, it's amazing to see where it's mor morphed to. But I couldn't, I, I didn't know, when I saw the influx of talent and how they had, they stayed, they've gone away from just hiring raw rookies or, or, two, or really, really green indie guys and started bringing in the, the Valors and Samoa Joes and, you know, uh, all these shield guys. Uh, you know, those guys had, had experience except for Reigns. So they brought in some guys that had a little bit more polish. So that told me that this thing could really be a, a good third brand. And a third brand doesn't mean it's the last brand. It's just another brand. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's a, uh, and quite frankly, some people seem to be more passionate about NXT and their presentation than they are uh, the main roster at times. Yeah, it's crazy. If you look at the crop of the guys they have right now, like you mentioned before, they started bringing the Ballers and the Joes, the Hideo Tommies, and so on and so forth. And on that DVD, the two matches, I'm looking at them here, Seth Rollins and Jinder Mahal to crown the first ever NXT champion, which you called. And I believe you also called Seth Rollins versus Biggie Langston for the NXT championship too. And I think it was after the first match, after Rollins won the championship and you call that match, you see all the guys come out. You see Roman Reigns. You see, uh, not Dean Ambrose. I don't think he was there at that time. But there was a number of other people that are now future stars in the promotion. Biggie Langston, you know, the New Day, all these guys are, were a major part of WrestleMania last year. So in the last three to four years alone, it's just amazing to see what's in, what it's evolved into. Um, but speaking of which, too, is there anyone a part of NXT right now that you would feel that you feel currently would be a huge big money player for WWE down the line once they get the main roster call up someone like a Balor or a Joe as you mentioned all the normal suspects are, are, are potentially uh, main players it's not so much it's less about all of it. it's, it's less about being all of them and more about being a really uh, strategic cooperative effort to roll out their new model to introduce them to the world in a in an impactful significant way uh, there's no doubt that, that if booked properly and obviously there are several guys in NXT that can come in and get over because they've had Finn Balor's had big match experience Tokyo Dome experience in New Japan uh, you know Samoa Joe international star uh, Joe's a, a great, great strategy Joe's a great coach so uh, 
uh, Joe knew how to get himself over, which is important. Mm -hmm. uh, so those guys are, are led by extensions to be stars. If the commitment is there from the company to give them the right persona, involve them in the right storyline, and, and introduce them in a significant way, uh, and then you only get that one time to make the, the, va the valued first impression. So I, I think that uh, the, really the focus on that question is more on WWE creative than it is on the two talents. I believe that the two talents, if they buy into the creative concept, and have a chance to uh, participate in the creation of it to some degree, have some input, then uh, there's no doubt in my mind that those two, are, those two guys there are, are can't-miss guys. They're going to get over and draw money. Yeah, it's a joint effort. Like you said, a guy like a Balor or a Joe has all the tools to be a main roster, a huge you know, main event player on the main roster at some point. But if the creative's not there, then it's not going to work. I mean, we've seen that before with guys like Neville. And I mean, all hope isn't lost for them yet. But I mean, just from the get-go, from their main roster call-ups. But yeah, those are a few people I definitely agree. Um, you know, definitely have the future ahead of them in, in terms of WWE pushing them prominently. And uh, final few questions here. Um, of course, in recent years with Vine and YouTube and stuff, you know, Videos have been going viral of people, you know, like some kid beating up, you know, a bunch of girls in his swimming pool, and they use your commentary from famous matches like, you know, Mick Foley versus The Undertaker, uh, famous Stone Cold Steve Austin calls and stuff like that. So, of course, to even non-wrestling fans, you are the voice of wrestling. So when you see stuff like that, when you get tagged in videos on Twitter, to viral videos on Vine and YouTube and whatever else, are you flattered by being often associated as the voice in wrestling and what people often imitate as, you know, like I said, the person personification of what commentary is in WWE or just wrestling on the whole? Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, it's always humbling, you know, to, to people to remember your work. You know, the the often repeated Hell in a Cell Foley Undertaker uh, scenario was 1998. Mm -hmm. So you're talking, you know, buku years ago. Uh, so that's 18 years ago, right? So, yes, correct, yeah. Uh, and some people were or just crawling around with their, you know, their, their baby pen. Uh, I get that, I get that stuff. I have people come up to me that can recite the whole thing. And they do, in my voice. So they say, try. Sometimes <laughs> I get so embarrassing, especially in a group of other people, like uh, waiting on uh, to board a plane. Mm -hmm. Had that happen the other day. Uh, it, was funny. it was funny. So the, the dad embarrassed the kid by becoming a kid again. So they saw me in line to board, boarding a plane and, you know, I was the voice of his childhood, so I that doesn't bother me. You know, hey, I'm I I don't have an issue with age is a number, and I feel great right now, and I'm uh, so I don't, I don't get offended by being the voice of anybody's childhood. As a matter of fact, it's it's really an honor. Uh, I you kid on like Bobby Heenan and Gorilla Mon Monsoon used to say when they somebody would come up and say, "You guys are my favorite broadcasters," and they'd almost in unison say, "You should set, set your goals higher." So uh, they're just, that's kind of how I, I just I have fun with it. I'm honored that it happens. Uh, and it's leading to interesting opportunities because I got calls actually later today with a couple of major sports uh, organizations looking to me to do some voiceovers. Hmm. And uh, so we'll see how that goes. And that's all as spawned on these those uh, those videos that were, were out there. Mm -hmm. So maybe after all these years, I'll find a way to monetize my voice and... Uh, in those calls because right now it's just for fun and, and it's good fun so I, I'm, I'm flattered by it you know the social media has changed the game man social media has changed everything that we do mm -hmm. how we look at things uh, how cynical we are sometimes all of us when our teams don't do well or our favorite whatever doesn't do well we have a way to express it so I'm, uh, but I'm always flattered with it and it's always really kind of interesting to see the creative ways that uh, they are uh, that they're using it. Because the more they dig on the, for audio, they're going to find even more of that stuff that's available that, that hasn't been overdone yet, that hasn't been aired, that they can utilize real creatively. So I think we're just starting to, to tip the iceberg on that stuff. But it's fun. It's fun. I, it's, it's, it's enjoyable. I enjoy sending them to my buddies and things, and they get a kick out of it. So, uh, you know, we're all having fun with it. 
And as you mentioned, a lot of potential projects coming up, and you've been doing boxing. You got, of course, like we're talking about right now, New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access TV Friday nights at nine. You're doing your one man shows, also coming up on WrestleMania weekend. But in, in addition to all of that, you got your podcast going on right now, The Ross Report, and you've recorded over a hundred episodes over the last two years. Um, what have been, who, or rather, who have been some of your favorite guests on the show on your podcast over the last couple of years? Uh, I have really had a uh, been lucky. Uh, I I book all my own guests. I write my own opens and closes, and and uh, my uh, you know my editorial remarks. So I'm really hands on on the show. So every show I have a really vested interest in, and I haven't had any shows I that I said, oh man, I wish I, I'd like to erase that one. They've all had their own. They've all had their moments, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can tell you that. Jim Cornette is a, a very compelling guest because he's extremely outspoken, uh, very intelligent, but he has to set in his ways in a lot of a lot of areas, and he's not willing to, to budge. Uh, but he's a guy that every time I have him on, we'll do well north of a million downloads that week. Wow. So uh, Steve Austin is a great guest because he's, he's another guy that's totally honest. Uh, so that's always good. I enjoyed having Ronda Rousey on. Mm-hmm. Uh, she was a she was fun because she is a big wrestling fan, and uh, she that was a really entertaining uh, show. I've had uh, Sean Grandy, the voice of the Celtics, uh, and the uh, Bellator, the friend of mine, is another good, uh, is a great guest. Uh, Mark Madden is a great guest at Pittsburgh because he's outspoken. Again, you want people on there that are honest. Uh, I got I got an interview coming up with Mark Merrow, which is absolutely captivating because mm-hmm. he's extremely honest and he's got such an amazing story to tell. Uh, that's going to be coming up right before the week of WrestleMania week. A really good interview. Uh, you know, it talks about finding out that his wife was, was seeing another guy on the road and how he was going to take care of that guy until he found out who the guy was. So that was a funny story. And he's got this very open and honest about his life. Mm-hmm. And I respect people like that. Uh, I got Gary Capetta on who kind of was, uh, had been on the scene, he, but he worked for WWE, he worked for WCW, he worked for NWA, he worked for AWA as a ring announcer for years. And he has so many great stories, he's an educator, very intelligent guy. So I've had some really unique guys on, guests on, and, and they've kind of come from off the radar. I just interviewed Mickey James this week for our, for our podcast that'll drop next week, and uh, she was absolutely uh, an open book. Mm-hmm. Talked about her relationship with John Cena and her leaving WWE and her getting reprimanded by Vince McMahon after winning at WrestleMania. I mean, it's really, she was just right out there and give me information I'd forgotten because I was there when she was having some of the issues. Mm-hmm. But uh, in any event, I enjoy doing the podcast and speak converse with my buddies and reconnect with people and ask questions I believe the fans want. And I also go on Twitter and I try to get the audience involved and let them submit questions as well. So, it's a fun process. Doing one show a week is great, and we're doing about seven hundred fifty thousand downloads on average every week. And some weeks it goes much higher than that. I had Sting on, and we did over two million downloads. Wow! And he was a great guest because we talked about the old days, working for Cowboy, and mm-hmm. working for Crockett, WCW days before he signed with WWE. Even though he was negotiating with them at that time, I, I knew it, but we weren't talking about it. So, but it was a good talking to him. He, he delivered the audience. And I shared that information with WWE. Hey, I just had Sting on my podcast, and he, and he nailed it two weeks in a row of over 2 million downloads a week. So uh, I think he's got an audience out there that would like to see him. That's what my market research told me. So mm-hmm. I have fun to the podcast. It's part of the highlight of my week. It's always a great listen. The fans can check it out every Wednesday, podcast one or Tuesday nights, rather, dropping at 9 o'clock Eastern time. Like I said, the one-man show is coming up over WrestleMania weekend. New Japan Pro Wrestling on Access TV, 9 o'clock on Friday nights. Uh, Jim, thanks so much for your time. Anything else you want to you know, plug for the people? Uh, website, Twitter, no, anything else? Good. I appreciate you having me on. My show's in uh, Dallas. Uh, all three shows look like they're going to sell out, which is cool, uh, at the House of Blues. Uh, two shows on Saturday, April 2nd, one show after Raw on Monday, and Ticketmaster has their, has tickets if you're interested in attending. I'd love to see you there. Uh, so just that information. And, of course, I think our, we're just kind of getting our journey underway with Access TV. A lot of exciting things are coming down the road. So people should stay tuned for that. The relationship between Access and New Japan is growing. Uh, I think Josh and I have a chance to really be a, a, a very uh, entertaining team to listen to. 
he's a, he's my he's a perfect partner for me to have on this project, and I think we're going to just get better and better as as time goes on. So that's the goal anyway. If we don't achieve our goals, it's not really going to be because of a lack of effort. We're really having fun, and everything I'm doing is uh, you know, uh, whether I did a crazy pay per view on Sunday, uh, March twentieth, uh, in Phoenix, the with Ken Shamrock and our student I should Ken Shamrock fell out. Uh, Dan Severin and, and Hank Abbott and Ray Mysterio versus Kurt Angle mm-hmm. and Chael Sonnen versus Michael Bisping in a grappling match. Roy Jones Jr. in an eight-round fight. So I'm staying busy, but my week really on TV centers around Friday nights and access. We're gonna, we're gonna we plan on really uh, making some uh, making a dent in the in the marketplace of that show. So hopefully, folks, t- try us out, tune in, and, and enjoy it. So you're gonna get us. You're gonna see. We're going to talk about what you're seeing. We're going to call the matches and add the drama and tell the backstories, let you know who these guys are and a little bit about them. But we're basically going to call the game. And the game is the thing. They make the music and we provide the lyrics. And so hopefully it'll be a nice little symphony when it's all said and done. So Friday night's on uh, good old Mark Cuban's TV. And by the way, another reason I like Mark Cuban, he has a lot of money. <laughs> How can you not like someone with money? I, I work for billionaire Ted, billionaire <laughs> Vince, and now billionaire Mark Cuban. Not a bad deal. Exactly. That's living life right there. Well, Jim, fantastic. Thanks so much for your time. I'm looking forward to all these projects, and uh, we'll catch you down the road. Thanks a lot again. Everybody, anytime.